is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all power and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all power and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels The 
is love of all is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice majesty
when with the ransom in glory his face I at last shall see will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me we're singing how excited that uh, we have some guests with us today, and so very warm welcome, and um, we have been studying uh, through the letter, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians for many months now, so I'm going to invite you to go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to be in uh, Verses 12 through 28. Now, I don't know if we're going to get through the whole passage or not this morning. There's a lot here, as you will see. Um, the last couple of days have been... Let's try that again. Uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through the end of the chapter. And as I was saying, there's a lot here in front of us. So whether or not we actually get through it all today is... Uh, up to the Lord, God willing, we'll make a good go at it. Amen? Amen. Uh, yeah, the Holy Spirit has a plan. Amen? Uh, last couple of days have been pretty crazy, so I haven't had the normal amount of time to focus on this passage of Scripture, but I know uh, that God's Word doesn't return void, and He's going to speak to every heart that's willing to hear. Amen? Amen. So... Um, Before uh, I move forward, I'm just going to... Um, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and look at our passage this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's stand. We're going to read the Word of God together. And then you can sit down for the duration of the service. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. The Apostle Paul, uh, writing to this small church in the city of Thessalonica... Uh, in the first century, but ultimately the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I this morning. Amen? And so this applies as much to us as it did to them. So let's go ahead and read. First Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 12, we read, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and, ab and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in, the, in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who, will also, who also will do it. 
Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you this morning confessing our need for you. Lord, that apart from you we can do nothing of any real merit or worth. And so, Lord, we, we come as we sang this morning empty-handed, but knowing it's your heart's desire to fill us this morning, to fill us with your spirit, to fill us with your truth, to fill us with the power and the faith to live out the Christian life in this dark world. So, Father, we pray, God, that you would find us this morning in that posture of obedience, that posture of submission. Lord, we need you to make the truths that we'll look at this morning a reality in our lives, Lord, that we would not be just hearers of your word, but doers also. Lord, we trust you to work this out in each of our lives as only you can, and we commit this time into your hands, praying that you would transform us that you would conform us through your spirit into the image of Christ and that we would be able to testify to this world around us that you are alive, that you are risen in power, and that you are good. Father, we, we trust you for this. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right, have a seat. It occurs to me that... Uh, if you're, if you're living in the West normally, uh, this Sunday might be considered uh, the triumphal entry Sunday. This is, next Sunday is uh, Easter in, in the West. Uh, we're celebrating Easter in May. Since we're, on the, we're here in Cyprus, we're, we're holding to the Orthodox calendar. The great thing is that you know, Jesus never commanded us to celebrate Easter. <laughs> he told us to keep communion, right? to remember his life and his death and his resurrection uh, whenever we come together and, and take communion together. Easter is a, a tradition of man, and so whether you celebrate it next Sunday or in a month and a half from now in May, it's all good, amen, as long as we're keeping him in our hearts and uh, walking it out in our lives, amen. All right, so uh, anyway, this, uh, this morning, as uh, we kind of are moving towards the end of this letter, that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians so long ago. Uh, again, there's, a, there's, there's so much here that we can uh, break down this morning. Uh, just to in, as an introduction for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, we, we left last week off in uh, chapter 5, verse 11. And Paul was talking to the, the Christians in Thessalonica, uh, Thess Thessalonica, forgive me, uh, about the, the return of Christ. And the Thessalonians were concerned because, you know, some of their members of their church had, had died, and they didn't really know where that fit into their theology. Uh, the first, the early church, you know, had this imminent expectation that Jesus would arrive momentarily. And so about the time that, you know, Christians started passing away for, for different reasons, there was kind of this question mark that was being raised in the minds of the, the believers. And they were like, well, if Jesus hasn't come back yet, what's going to happen to those that have died in faith? And so we looked at that last week. And basically, we saw two separate times the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonians to encourage one another. And, and hallelujah, we're able to encourage one another with this same precious truths that uh, we looked at last week as well as today. Uh, Paul pointed out to the Thessalonians that uh, back in chapter 4, verse 15 through 18, we had our, our first reference to encouraging one another. 
He said, Therefore this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So he basically explained that when Jesus returns, those who had died in the faith would be resurrected and would... uh, would meet the Lord in the air, and that those who were alive and and, uh, remaining at the time of Christ's return would be transformed, they would be uh, translated, if you will, caught up, uh, raptured off of the earth, and uh, join those uh, believers with Christ at his return. And he said, comfort one another with these words. You know, regardless of whether they died before his return or were alive at his return, we were all ultimately going to end up in God's presence together. And that was a cause for great hope, for great confidence, uh, regardless of what the world may throw at us, regardless of you know, what uh, the weakness of our flesh may uh, produce, uh, the, the attacks of the enemy. Regardless, we have this hope that we will be with Christ when he returns. Now, Paul uh, emphasizes or reiterates that encouragement. Uh, We saw this last week in chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, where we finished off last time. Paul, writing in uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, he says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that we should live together with him, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So last week, we talked a little bit about the day of the Lord, this this day that the Bible refers to that is is coming in the future, a day of judgment upon the earth, a God-rejecting world will eventually have to uh, come to grips with the fact that he, has sent his, he will send his son to set up his kingdom at last upon the earth. And, and for the believer, that day of judgment is not something that we are to fear. As Paul says here, God did not appoint us to wrath. Jesus paid the price already on the cross. And he is not going to call upon us to pay that price a second time. Hallelujah. That's a, you know, that's great news for us, especially when we look around the world and how dark and troubled and and confusing it is now to know that uh, we have been saved from the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment upon the earth. You know, all the way back in the book of Genesis, you know, Abraham, this great father of the faith, when he was uh, conversing with the Lord on the day when God was going to pour out his judgment upon the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. This was a, uh, a microscopic version of you know, what will happen at the end of the age when God pours out his wrath upon the world. And Abraham argued, if you will, or, or reasoned with the Lord about the fate of this city, Sodom and Gomorrah. He said in Genesis 18.25, he says, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Hallelujah. What, What was true for them then is all the more true for us today, because we have been made righteous in Christ Jesus through our faith in him. And through the finished work of the cross, we know that Jesus has already taken the wrath of God upon himself on our behalf. Hallelujah. And God will not require us to go through that wrath that we have already, you know, has already been paid for through Christ Jesus. We are the body. You know, the Bible says that the the church, we, you and I, as, as believers this morning, are the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We are not his enemy. Amen. And you'll, you, we noticed this last week. We didn't really bring it out necessarily in the context of the passage. But if you go back and you read chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, you will see that Paul emphasizes the fact, you know, he talks about they, those 
people that will come under the judgment of God at the end of the age versus us who are, you know, uh, alive in Christ, who are believers. He makes a very clear distinction between us and them, if you will. And it's not that God, it's not that Paul, you know, had it out for the sinful world any more than God does. We, we looked at that last week. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. Rather, that we would repent and live. Amen? And, and, and so, uh, again, Paul telling the, the Corinthians, comfort one another with these words. As, as dark and difficult as the times are that we are living in, uh, we have a hope, a steadfast hope in Christ Jesus the Lord. That the, the events that are going to happen, going to unfold at some point in the future, however far or, or near those events may be, uh, we have been delivered, we have been saved out of them through the blood of our Savior Christ Jesus the Lord. We don't need to fear like others. We don't need to be in doubt and anxiety as those who have no hope, no faith in Christ Jesus. And so God help us as the church today to be living out our faith in a way that is tangible and real in the world in which we live, where, where that, that peace that we possess through him is evident that we're not carried away by every shifting sand of, of, of circumstance. You know, I thank God for the hope that we have in Him. Amen. The news this week is just, you know, terrible everywhere you turn. And yet the scriptures say that these things pale in comparison to what the final days will look like. And so encourage one another, amen? amen? Encourage one another. So with all that kind of as a lead up, we, we pick up in verse 12 this morning where the Apostle Paul, you know, he, he's, he's basically moving towards his exit now in the letter and he wants to uh, encourage and challenge the believers and so in verse 12, we read there, Paul says, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. In Paul's first and second letter to the Thessalonians, he uses the term brethren 27 times. 27 times. And for those of you who are just joining this study, you know, Paul was the father of these believers, he, spiritual father of these believers. He, you go back to the book of Acts and you, we read the story about how Paul came to the, the city of Thessalon, uh, Thessalonica and he spent a month maybe uh, there and managed to establish a church before he had to leave them prematurely because of conflict. He had to leave them before he would have desired to. Uh, and yet... As he's writing this letter, just a short time later, we see him really just emphasizing the fact that the, these, these Thessal Thessalonians have, have come into a new spiritual family. 27 times in two very short letters, he, he uses the term brethren. And of course, in modern translations, you know, you're going to find brothers and sisters. And uh, it alludes to the fact that, you know, we are a family in Christ Jesus. We are sons and daughters of the living God. And now we have been brought in uh, through uh, the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And one of the reasons I want to, you know, linger on this for a moment is because, you know, with any family, you, you're going to have challenges. Amen? I mean, look around just this room. Between the difference in our languages, our nationalities, our uh, cultural backgrounds, even the age differences within just this room alone, uh, if you remove Jesus from the equation, we would fly in different directions like, you know, uh, I don't know, explosively, right? 
But because of Christ Jesus, because of the love of God, the grace of God, and what God has done in reaching out to every single person in this room, he has brought us together as a family in Christ Jesus. We are sons, you know, uh, John says in his Gospels that through uh, faith in Christ Jesus, we have been given the right to become sons and daughters of the living God. Hallelujah. So, you know, regardless of what your family life at home may be like, I, I hope and pray that you can look around the room and say, I, I'm in, you know, I'm among family this morning. And for a lot of us, our spiritual family in Christ is way more real than our blood brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles that we have. But like with any family, you know, there's always potential and temptation for division, right? And, you know, one of Satan's favorite tactics to try and defeat the church from carrying out its purpose is to divide us, to get you and I to focus on each other's failures and shortcomings and our flaws, and to so you know, concentrate on our differences that we're incapable of coming together and getting anything done. That, that, that is just a typical standard strategy of the enemy to cause division, to get us to stop focusing on Jesus who brings us together and start focusing on one another and what makes us different. And he's pretty good at it. Most of us can probably point to, you know, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you can probably point to one experience or another where you saw division come into the body of Christ. Well, there's two ways that Satan will try to exploit, you know, our tendency to focus on people's flaws. First of all, he'll get us to focus on our own failures. He'll get us to focus on how far short we fall uh, in terms of being a part of the body of Christ. Paul would talk about this to the Corinthians at some length. He, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, using this analogy of the body, of uh, the church as being a body, he, he says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? So he, he puts forward this kind of you know, silly question. You know, if, uh, you know, if the foot should look down upon itself because it's not as high profile as the hand is, uh, you know, Paul asks the question, does that make it any less a part of the body? Well, the, the, question is, the, the answer, of course, is no, it's not. But you and I, it points out the fact that we have this tendency Right to look around the room and think, oh man, you know, I'm not like brother so and so or like sister whosoever. You know, I don't have those gifts. I don't have that personality. You know, I, I know what a terrible, rotten, lousy sinner I really am, and I don't even belong here. You know, and, and that's just the enemy. That's just the devil trying to keep us in this place of condemnation, this place of defeat, where we just feel like we don't measure up, where we don't belong in the body. And, and that is, a, again, a typical tactic of the enemy, this, this self-depreciation, uh, depre uh, deprecation that we, we tend to slip into. Well, of course, on the opposite polar end of that, we have the enemy's uh, perhaps even more effective tactic, and that is to get you and I to exalt ourselves. The, uh, the opposite of uh, self-deprecation, self-exaltation. And Paul talks about this too with the Corinthians in the same book, the same chapter, just a couple of verses later, later, again, using the same analogy of the body being made up of different members. Paul says, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And again, it's a silly picture you know, of the body's tendency to, you know, fight against itself. But the, the principle there is that, you know, we get full of pride, spiritual pride, and we start looking down our nose 
at our brothers and sisters around us and we start focusing on their flaws and what, what makes us different. And, you know, if we're not paying attention, the enemy just has a field day with it, right? He's just having a good old time, causing us to fight and, and bicker and, and squabble among ourselves. You know, one of the strongest letters that we have in the New Testament in terms of correction is uh, Paul's letter to the Galatian church. And this was a, this was a church that was, go, was, was really being uh, faced with a huge temptation to, to really walk away from Christ into a legalistic lifestyle. And Paul uses some pretty harsh language to try and get the Galatians' attention. He calls them fools. He calls them bewitched. He calls, you know, he he doesn't pull any punches. And yet, 13 times in the letter of Galatians, he calls them brethren. In spite of the, you know, the challenges that they were facing and how dangerously close they were to committing apostasy, he still said, but you're still my brothers. You're still my family. And as your, you know, as your spiritual father, it's my my duty, my obligation, out of love, I'm reaching out to you to warn you and correct you. And that's a beautiful thing because that's what family does. Jesus said the world would know you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. By the love that you have for one another. And when we talk about that love, it's not just that soft you know, fuzzy, feel-good kind of love that we all enjoy and appreciate, amen? But it's also that love that calls a person out when they're going in the wrong direction. A love that brings correction, a love that brings uh, rebuke. And uh, it's it's a love that, you know, will do what needs to be done to keep a family member walking with the Lord. And so again, Paul says, you know, brothers, sisters, he's, he's getting ready to wrap up this letter, and he's covered a lot of territory up to this point, and now as he's starting to move towards signing off, he, he has a, a list of encouragements as well as exhortations for them that are very relevant for you and I still today. So Paul says, we urge you, brethren, we urge you, brothers and sisters, we urge you, family, to recognize those who labor among you, uh, those who labor over you in the Lord, and those who admonish or warn you. Now, here we have in verse 11, Paul saying, you know, brethren, we urge you. We're going to see in verse 14, he's going to say, we, we, uh, we exhort you. So he's starting off with an encouragement, and then he's going to move into a, a challenge, into a, a warning, if you will. And he says, we urge you to recognize those who labor among you, over you in the Lord, those who admonish you. So in spite of the age of this group of believers in Thessalonica, clearly they had leaders in place. And Paul encourages the church to recognize them, to remember them, uh, those who are laboring, working among them, those who are over them in terms of authority, those who are admonishing and encouraging and in challenge and 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 challenging them. Uh, And so Paul's saying, listen, you know, for those who are laboring among you, serving the Lord, shepherding you, caring for you, serving you, he says, I I admonish you to, to recognize them. And I'm sure that Paul was not trying to create any sort of celebrity mentality of the leadership, God forbid. Jesus said, those who want to be great in the kingdom of God must become the servants of all. 
And so what, when you and I look around at the world today and we see all, all these kind of, you know, big time celebrity pastors and preachers and, and everything else, uh, we need to be careful. Because man was never meant to be put on a pedestal. It's a terrible temptation. It's a terrible temptation. And we've seen it, you know, just this week or in the last couple weeks, you know, the, the Orthodox Church here has been hit with terrible scandal. You know, men who have basically been held in, you know, this kind of untouchable sort of context for so long have suddenly turned out to be surprise, surprise sinners. In spite of the robes, in spite of the, you know, the magnificent buildings and all of the rituals and, and everything else, scandal. And people, you know, who have been holding them in this state of high regard, are, are, their, their faith has been rocked, their confidence is in the Lord, no doubt, has been challenged. I mean, it's the whole island is talking about it, from what I understand. And so the leadership in church was never meant to have this sort of celebrity status that we see so often in the world today. Again, not to place uh, leaders on a, on a pedestal, but Paul is, you know, saying, listen, for those who are serving the Lord, those who are kind of on the, the front lines, if you will, recognize them. Let them know that you appreciate their service, their labor for the Lord. Esteem them very highly, he says, in love for their work's sake. And I love that. He emphasizes, esteem them in love. Let them know how much you love them. And, and I thank God that we serve such a generous church. I have no doubts where everyone's hearts are in relationship to those who are serving in leadership here in this church. We are well loved. We are highly esteemed. And uh, we thank God for every single one of you. Uh, but we have enough guests to justify unpacking this because, you know, maybe you're going to go home and you realize, hey, you know what? I haven't been esteeming those who are laboring over us. And it's important. It's our God-given responsibility to recognize those who have uh, stepped forward in faith, responded to a calling upon their life to care for, to shepherd, to serve to minister in whatever capacity that uh, we may be called to, to build up the body. You know, and it's interesting because Paul says, you know, highly esteem them. In other words, give them special attention. Why? Because the enemy is giving them special attention. Again, you know, the moment you step out in faith, in response to a calling upon your life, you discover you have this thing on your back. <laughs> it's called a, a target, a bullseye. And the enemy will zero in on you, and he will do everything in his power to wear you down, discourage you, keep you in condemnation, so that you won't be able to serve effectively. And so, uh, you know, I, I believe the, you know, kind of the, what, what Paul's alluding to here is, is if the enemy's going to give that special attention to those who are serving in, in leadership, then the body of Christ needs to give them that special attention in love to make sure that they are feeling girded up, uplifted in prayer, and, you know, recognized. James writes in James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, there's a lot of debate exactly about what this verse means. Uh, was James talking about stricter judgment of man? The stricter judgment of God? Stricter judgment of self? I 
tend to think it probably comprises all three. You know, the moment you get up and, and, and dare to, you know, suggest that you represent God on some level or another, uh, people, the enemy, again, uh, are, are going to scrutinize your life so much more than if you just kind of <laughs> maybe play it safe, you know, uh, if, if you will. And so James here, you know, says that those who are in positions of, I mean, he's, he's specif- specifically uh, emphasizes teachers, but I think the principle exists kind of across the board in terms of anyone who is in some sort of leadership capacity that we will receive a, a stricter judgment. And the idea that I will be under a stricter judgment before God is a terrifying thought, if, it, if not for the grace of God. The only means by which I or anyone else could dare to stand. And so, again, Paul here encourages the believers, the Holy Spirit encouraging us, recognize those who labor among you. We've got an incredible ministry team here, and they work hard, and many of them work tirelessly without receiving any recognition for anything that they do. And, you know, God help us to be a a people who are recognizing, esteeming very highly in love those who are laboring among us. In Hebrews 13, 11, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, there it is again. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So there's a responsibility that we have as a family. Amen? as believers, as brothers and sisters, you know, to encourage those who are serving and laboring, leading uh, in any capacity among you. Find some way to recognize them, to thank them, to encourage them and come alongside them. So with that encouragement, Paul uh, turns in verse 14 to some exhortations. He says, now we exhort you, brethren, Again, family, brothers and sisters, we exhort you, we encourage, we challenge. Interesting, that word exhort is the word uh, uh, parakaleo, which we use today as our Greek uh, term, thank you, right? Or you're welcome, sorry. You're welcome. Uh, So still a word that's very much in usage today uh, on a daily basis in many of our lives. Uh, Parakaleo, it has a different meaning, though, in the first century than it does now. Uh, It says it means to call near. It means to invite, to beseech, to entreat, or to pray even. And so, again, Paul's speaking to uh, the church, the Holy Spirit speaking to us this morning I exhort you, I call you, I, ex- I, I beseech you, I entreat you. What? Warn those who are unruly. Warn those who are unruly. Now, we've got a long list here. We have uh, potentially 15 admonitions here. We will not deal with each of them individually. <laughs> You'll be happy to hear that there's uh, some very, you know, Paul uses some very uh, large brush strokes in these exhortations. You'll you'll see the word all and uh, everything a a, a lot here, kind of encompassing uh, always, all, you know, uh, basically just kind of encompassing our entire lives, our entire walk as Christians. He says, so we exhort you, brethren, uh, warn those who are unruly. Uh, That word unruly in your translation may be uh, disorderly, right? And it's actually a military term that means disorganized. It means to unarrange. In other words, to break ranks. 
So Paul says, uh, warn those who are unruly. You know, if, if we were to liken the body of Christ as an army, he says, you know, warn those who have broken rank, who feel like they're kind of the spiritual lone rangers, right? Who they don't need church. You know, I, I'm saved. I'm in the blood of Christ. I know Jesus and I don't need church and all of that other stuff. Well, that's convenient, but it's not biblical. It's comfortable, but it's not biblical. Because again, as we have you know, emphasized so much here this morning, we need each other. And you know, when, we, when we meet that occasional person who feels like they don't need to be a part of the body of Christ in a practical sense, uh, the, the scriptures say you know, that we are obligated to one another to warn one another that there aren't any soloists in the body of Christ, as it were. Now, there, I understand there are legitimate reasons and illegitimate reasons why people opt out of the church body life. You know, some people have been terribly wounded by the church. They've had terrible experiences, unfortunately, in the name of Christ. They've been hurt disillusioned, uh, maybe slandered and, and discarded. And, and so there are people who have legitimate reasons why, you know what, I'll, I remember we had a, but, you know, it, it's just an example of the tendency, that, you know, that some people have a legitimate reason to just feel like, you know what, forget the church. I, I, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't do church. And it's our responsibility as brothers and sisters in love, to, to try and, you know, bring them back into a, a biblical relationship with the larger body of Christ. And, of course, there's a lot of people out there that have bad excuses why they don't do church. And, of course, you know, with our technological age, it's really easy, isn't it, just to stay home and watch online. You know, you can do church in your pajamas, you have a nice cup of coffee. You don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to deal with any drama, uh, you know, uh, relationships or anything else. And uh, easy peasy, right? <laughs> but that is, those are illegitimate reasons, right? Just we need each other. And, and the beautiful thing is we are saved sinners. And, and if we just come in, you know, with that, that kind of default understanding, then we'll have realistic expectations of each other. <laughs> well, no, you know what? The only reason this guy's here is because of the grace of God. The only reason any of us are here is because of the grace of God. And so, you know, this morning, if you're here and, and you know, it's, uh, you just find it way easier to do Christianity on your own, we understand, but it's just not what God has called you to. Wow, really? Five minutes already. Okay. Verse 14, comfort the faint-hearted. Uh, this, this word faint-hearted in the Greek means to be small-spirited. And, and it basically carries the picture of a person who has for whatever reasons, is, is just in a position, is kind of in a state of defeat and discouragement. They're, they're believers. They put their faith in Christ. They, they've got the Holy Spirit, but for some reason, they're just living, you know, with this cloud over their heads. And again, so comfort the faint-hearted, or the, your translation may say feeble-minded. But again, the Greek actually means small-spirited, and, you know, this kind of person may feel like they're very high maintenance, you know, that they just need a lot of strength and support and, and, you know, need someone alongside of them all the time. But you know what? Again, as the body of Christ, that's what we're called to, to strengthen, the, or comfort, forgive me, the, the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Interesting. This term, uphold the weak, He's not talking about physically weak. 
It's talking about spiritually weak. And the, the fascinating thing is that if you look at an overall kind of biblical idea of what Paul considered to be a spiritually weak person, he's talking about, quite likely, talking about someone who's just legalistic. That they're still relating to God in a very legalistic way. You know, it's about their relationship hinges upon their performance. You know, whether they're having a good day religiously. You know, what church you belong to, the way you dress, the way you carry yourself, you know. Uh, your amount of time you give to Bible study and prayer and all these. You know, it's, it's about what you do instead of who you are. And the beautiful thing is that Paul, when he compares these two, in Romans 15, 1, for example, he says, Then we who are strong are, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So we, you know, who are strong in the grace of God are to encourage those who are still kind of bound up in legalistic sort of, you know, relationship. Anyway, as much as I would love to break this down further, I think we're going to have to do a part two next week. Uh, let's just finish the list very quickly. Picking up in verse 14, he says, We exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Now, this is where we start getting into these kind of broad brush strokes, where he starts making these really big asks. Uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. There it is again. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Uh, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So again, Paul's just being you know, very open-armed about all of these Christian virtues. He says, whether it is rejoicing or prayer or giving thanks, whether it is pursuing good, whether, whether it is responding to evil, whether it's patience, he says, you know, big hearts, big arms, that's who we are, the body of Christ, alive and real and relevant in the world in which we live. Do not, uh, and by the way, he, he adds on there in verse 18, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This isn't an option. This isn't a maybe or a possibly. This is the will of God. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what our resume looks like. Amen? Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Your translation may say abstain from the very appearance of evil. That's like next level scrutiny of how we are living out our lives, carrying out our behavior. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, body, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful, and he, uh, who will also do it. Hallelujah. Just in case you're feeling overwhelmed by that whole list of requirements, or not requirements, but characteristics, really, of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, you can just fall back and take a nice deep breath he who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. If we allow him that space in our lives, he'll bring that to pass. Amen? Amen. All right, uh, I think we're going to come back to this passage one more time next week. Uh, just to do it justice, we'll, we'll finish there. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for our beautiful, colorful, crazy family. Lord, even as we look around just this small room and we, we, we see that we are just a tiny percentage of what our family looks like around the world. We thank you, Lord, that you don't see our denominations. 
We are your sons and your daughters. We are, we are the church. We are the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that beyond that, Lord, we have only your, your grace to celebrate. We will not, our hope in heaven is not based upon what church we belong to, what leaders we are under, but it's the blood of Christ. It's our Savior, our Messiah, our King. We belong to Him. We belong to you, Father. And we thank you that heaven won't know any of those things. We will be resurrected and reunited with you eternal, eternally in glory and perfection. Lord, until that day comes, God, help us to preserve the unity of the Spirit in our midst. Lord, help us to be the people that you've called us to be. Lord, help us to encourage and exhort and equip one another, Lord, to, to serve you and to fulfill your calling upon our lives. We give you praise. We give you glory. We thank you that it's all through the blood of your son, Christ Jesus, and our faith in him. I pray this morning, if there's anyone here who has never surrendered to you, Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day, Lord, that they would cry out to you in faith, repent of their sins, receive you as Lord and Savior, and be adopted into your family forever. Lord, we trust you to work this out through your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God. Worthy